what will data science innovation look like when most models are now accessed through APIs versus coming up with new models? So when I wrote my book, Deep Learning Illustrated, which was published in 2019, the vast majority of the AI capabilities at that time, I could have my readers create the model on their local computer. And some of the models in the book, I was like, you're gonna need cloud compute resources to do this. You'll want a GPU in the cloud, one GPU in the cloud to be training this model architecture. And now, just a couple of years later, these state-of-the-art, these foundational models, these large language models that we're seeing that we've been talking about so much in this episode, GPT-3, soon to be GPT-4, Dolly 2 uh, ChatGPT, image and video, these require hundreds of the highest spec GPUs training for very long periods of time over very large data sets. And so most people use these out of the box without doing any model training. And that's part of what makes them so transformative and why we call them foundational models, because they allow us um, to be, uh, so that the generative pre-trained transformer is what GPT stands for. So generative outputting stuff, <laughs> uh, outputting text. Uh, pre-trained is the key thing here that I'm talking about. Transformer is the architecture aspect of it. And we're not going to dig into that too much in this episode, but it's a way of architecting your model. But it's that letter P, the pre-trained, that is key here, which is that these large language models are capable of doing such an enormous wide variety of tasks that they haven't been explicitly trained to, trained to do. And so we can just use them by calling APIs. So you can use the OpenAI GPT API for a very wide range of applications my company Nebula has been able to prototype a number of really mind-blowing uh, features for our users that would have taken us months of data collection and model prototyping. And we were just like, why don't we see if we can do that with the <laughs> GPT-3 API? And we were blown away by the results. So that kind of thing is happening more and more. You can also fine tune some of these models. So there are API endpoints for fine tuning models like GPT-3 to your own particular data, but you would be doing that for a very, very, very small fraction of the time that the whole model had trained beforehand. So anyway, I've talked a whole bunch. Sadie, what do you think about Mark's point here? I think this is a very good point. And beyond just plugging into some of these models, I think it's going to really revolutionize like how we learn and how it assists us in our jobs. So as you may know, I teach a class, SQL for Data Science, and I can pretty much take, I don't know if I should say this, but I can take any question from that class and put it into GPT chat, and it gives me a really great answer, right? Wow. So uh, I, I know students have already probably figured this out, but if you start to think about that, you know, things I've started to do with it as well as, you know, I asked and I said, create a test script for me in Python where I perform an EDA analysis. I provided the data. Then I said, I also wanted you to build a neural network and it built me the whole script. And it gives me such a great framework to start to play around with and try. And it, it, it took less than 30 seconds, right? So right. when you look at that, you go, what do you really need to learn? And then how is this either going to optimize your job or also how is it going to change your job? Um, you can build a virtual machine within it. And so I think there's a lot that, not just from using it from an application standpoint, but using it in your day-to-day -day work. And then what do you need to learn to get into the space? I don't know yet. It's It's been a week since I've played around with it, but <laughs> it's making me start to rethink like, is there a way I could reteach data science having mm. an assistant? And so mm -hmm. that's that's maybe more of a personal prediction of a trend I'll be exploring more. Like, is there a new way to learn? But a caution to that too is it's learning based off of past humans' work, right? So mm -hmm. if humans aren't adding new work, is it going to come up with the new work in the new innovative ways? I don't know. It's, it's going to be an interesting time to see how it continues to evolve. 
There is, so the, and that touches on how it will also encode biases that mm-hmm. humans have had in the past and written down and are abundant on the internet. And then the other thing about these large language models, which I don't know how this influences what it's doing with the questions that you asked it for your SQL course, for example, but these models hallucinate is the term that we use. So they will very confidently say inaccurate things. Now, lots of people do that. (laughs) My sister says that I do that. (laughs) Um, And yeah, so my sister will, she'll, uh, she'll say, why, why are you, why are you saying that a year ago? You said the opposite. I'm like, you should listen to, (laughs) I'm trying to be better, especially on air. I try to like really hedge things and I'm very, I'm very, I, I hope I've been working with that feedback over the years and I, I'm less uh, recklessly confident with things I say, especially on air, uh, but I'm sure it happens from time to time. And some people that we all know people who do it more than others. So some people are really cautious about the things they say, and some people are really reckless about the things that they say confidently. And that doesn't mean that they're lying because they really believe it. And, and so anyway, so we see that happening with these machines too, but, uh, it can end up being extra bizarre in the case of these large language models, because they can have a really expert vocabulary. Mm -hmm. So they, you can ask them a question like, you know, an advanced SQL question or an advanced quantum physics question, and it might be able to use all of the right language so that you as a novice question asker, you don't have the capacity to distill whether this is right or wrong. So students in your course could be using ChatGPT to answer all the questions, but some of them could be getting answers that are completely off and they won't even have any idea. (laughs) And so that has implications for us. And I don't, I don't, I'm not aware of uh, immediately forthcoming solutions to this where uh, you know, models are able to be accompanied by some kind of like truthfulness score. <laughs> um, I, I mean, that, we could get into a little bit of philosophy of like some things of truth are subjective, right? And that may take us down a different rabbit hole. But I think where I would like to go in my research is just looking at what came up for people when like Google first really started to become mainstream and people realized that they had access to all this information. I, I wonder if some of the same questions and problems that people were proposing then be true today. Um, I think history is, you know, even though we have innovative new technology, there's patterns that are similar because humans are interacting with it in a, in a similar way. And so I'm curious, you know, I didn't, when I, in high school, I didn't have the internet. And so writing papers was a different experience than in college when you had Wikipedia and you had Google. And I think we will adapt. And I'm a little worried about what this next generation of, of kids will do because I feel like I'm going to be left in the dust and, and soon be a dinosaur with the technology that they're growing up with today. 